I love art books, and over the years I've collected quite a few of them, and today I'm going to take you on a journey sharing some of my personal favorites, along with some books that I think are just good to have as reference material as an artist. So I'm going to break this video into five separate categories. We're going to first talk about my favorite art books, and these are ones that I reference all the time when I'm doing my own drawing. And then I'm going to talk about the more objective, practical books. So we got anatomy, animals, and then fashion, and then we're going to end off with decorative books. And if any of these are speaking to you while I'm talking about them, I'll be sure to put a link in the description on where to find that book. That way you can own a copy for yourself. So to start off my favorite art books, we're going to talk about the one that I reference the absolute most, and he is probably my favorite artist, and this is The World of Mucha. So side note, I just found out that his last name is actually pronounced Mucha, but because of force of habit, I'm just going to say Mucha for the rest of this video. I'm so sorry, Alphonse, but it would just be easier than me trying to correct myself constantly in this video. His work is absolutely incredible, and I'll try my best during these book reviews not to talk about the artist too much and more about the book specifically and how they captured their work. And this book does a really good job of just that. It really does fill every page, and sometimes some pages will have a few of his works or like four stacked on top of each other. They really try to fit as much content as they can into this single book. I find Muka's work to just be super inspiring. It kind of borders on being fantastical but still realistic. And while Muka is mostly known for his advertisement decals, I actually think of him more for his hands. Whenever you look at his illustration work, every time he has a figure, the hands are so posed in an intentional and purposeful way that I love looking at the way he captures them. And then he also does fabric super, super well. If you ever wanted to study how to break down fabric without having to render or shade it, but still capture the movement and the flow of the texture, this book is a great reference for that. Muka's work inspires me so much because I feel like he does a really good job balancing it being super fantastical but yet still rooted in realism, and that's definitely the area of art that I like to be in myself. It's so decadent and ornate, and a lot of the books that I have on my list kind of fill in that overly detailed aesthetic, but I just love it so much. This book covers the span of his work during his lifetime. So you see a lot of the advertisement work, a lot of label design that I didn't even know he did. It even covers the grand epics that he did, and they are enormous paintings. And I really want to go see them in person one day, I think that would just be a cool experience. But for now, I guess I'll have to suffice with having to look at them in this book. So I feel like I was already on this path, but when I discovered Muka's work, I feel like he pushed me even further into the realm of loving these overly decadent, intricately detailed illustrations that really focused on kind of borderline gaudy design elements, but I absolutely love it. And there will be a few artists on this list that kind of fall into that same realm, but I just, I'm fascinated by that type of work. So I feel like this wouldn't be a true favorite art book list if I didn't put The World of Muka at the very top. Okay, next up, we have a three book bundle and it is called The Sky, which is Yoshitaka Amano's collected works while he worked with Final Fantasy. And this is so heavy, it can also double as weightlifting if you need it to. So if you open it up, you can see that there are three books and these books span the illustration work that he did from Final Fantasy 1 all the way up to 10. I played Final Fantasy X and Kingdom Hearts when I was about 13 years old, so it had a pretty big impact on me. But back then, I always liked Tetsuya Nomura's work, who was the concept artist at Squaresoft at the time, and I didn't really understand why there was so much Amano hype. I know people kind of saw him as like the Final Fantasy guy, but I didn't see it that way. I thought he was overrated. Ironically, now that I'm an adult, he's actually probably one of my favorite artists to ever live. I think he's so, so good, I just couldn't quite comprehend why it was so good when I was younger. I like to compare Amano to like fine dining. As a kid, you might not really enjoy or appreciate why this food is so expensive and why it is supposed to be so good because at that time, you know, you just like french fries and ice cream. But then as your palate develops and as you mature, you understand why the fine dining is much better. And that's how I see Amano's artwork. It just gets better as you get older. 
Kind of a weird comparison, but I think I understand, so hopefully you get it too. Anyways, even though Final Fantasy X is probably my favorite game ever, I actually enjoy looking at the first two art books in this collection more, which covers Final Fantasy 1 through 6. And the reason for that is I feel like they're just more whimsical in nature. I feel like their designs are more loose and vague, where I feel as he got into the later entries in the series, it started to tighten up more. But earlier on, you can just see how free and fluid all of his illustrations were. And the things that I just did not like as a kid are are the things that I love as an adult. The quick gesture line strokes and the way that he colored the images, there is so much confidence behind it that I now understand why people revere him as a living legend. He is also an artist that I really appreciate for how he balances contrast, but not with values, but with detail. He's very good at having very ornate, compacted areas of detail, and then having just a giant area of like nothing. It'll just be negative space where it's a breath of fresh air. And I have to remember that within my own work, that it's actually better to have areas of more detail in one section and then other areas where there's very little detail to help balance them out. And his earlier work really dabbles into that 80s fantasy aesthetic that I absolutely admire. There's just a lot of bold colors, fabric flowing, jewelry covering every part of the body for no reason, and I'm a big fan. So if this type of stuff really speaks to you, I promise that this collection is so worth it. And I look at this a lot whenever I'm feeling kind of uninspired or unmotivated. It'll be a quick pick me up to be like, oh yeah, I love dabbling in this gaudy, decadent pool of character design. Let's try to knock something out that is inspired by something from these pages. Gosh, it's kind of fun even looking at them for this book review. And I'm just reminded how much I love the art style. <laughs> he does such a good job at capturing it. So if you're into Final Fantasy or just classic fantasy design in general, then I think this is a good collection to own. Ooh. Who needs to go work out when you could just lift your art books? Let's get this bottom shelf back in order here. So the next book on my list is another collection work of an artist that's not as well known, but his name is Harry Clark, and the title of the book is an imaginative genius in illustrations and stained glass arts. A little bit of a mouthful, but I love this guy's work and I'm excited to show this art book with you all. So Harry Clark isn't really as well known as a lot of the other artists in the early 1900s, but I think a big reason for that was a lot of artists were pushing more color and more beautiful, where he was pushing a little bit more dark, a little more macabre. But what's interesting is he still carries a lot of that overly intricate design elements into his work as the other artists that were doing more beautiful stuff. And don't get me wrong, I find Harry's work to be just as beautiful, but just in different ways. His illustrations are so complex and he puts a lot of heart into the detailing that he does, but you can always tell he purposely makes it a little off. That could be with compositions that are just slightly off center. This could be with subject matter that's just a little on the spooky macabre side. Anything that he does, I feel like it's really pretty and then he turns it into this dark realm. And just like most of the art books in my favorite list, this one does a great job, once again, at showing the illustrations on every single page. There's not as much verbiage as there is just pure art. As a black and white artist, I'm so inspired by him because you can tell how confident he is with having really bold design values next to really light ones. And he's really okay with working in the negative space in an image to help balance the overall composition. Some of his work will be filled from the top of the page to the bottom, which is pure detail or subject matter or lines, whatever it is. And then other pieces of his work will have really intricate subject matters and then just negative space covering the rest of the page. And this book pretty much covers all of his work from his black and white ink drawings to a lot of the color work he did. And in the back section of the book, it actually covers the stained glass illustrations that he created. And when I bought this book, I had no idea that he even did stained glass. So this was like a really nice surprise when I was flipping through the pages. I'm super intrigued by stained glass myself. So to see the way that he handled the transition from his overly ornate detailed ink drawings and pulling that into his colored stained glass work was just really incredible to look at. So even though his work does kind of border more on the macabre side, I still think this is such a good reference book for anyone that's into super intricate ink and line work. And especially if you're a black and white artist, I think Harry Clark is such a good reference to pull from. Plus it's just bizarrely decadent for seemingly no reason. And I've always loved when artists do that. So alongside Muka and Amano, I feel like Harry is the third artist that I really enjoy in 
would put in my top favorites, but he's kind of like a secret. Not a lot of people know about him. I'm so glad that now people are becoming more aware of him, and I hope videos like this will expose his work even more. So yeah, I think this is a great book, and now the secret's out there. Go check out his work. So next up, we have an art book that I probably used the most when I was in college, but he still holds a special place in my heart. And that is Norman Rockwell, and with the art book, 332 magazine covers. So just like Amano's book, this is a very heavy one. So if you wanna double it as a weightlifting tool and get your reps in, then this will do the job. Anyways, Norman Rockwell's work is absolutely amazing. I know that Americana work isn't as popular nowadays, but I don't care. I still love it and especially the way that he creates textures. There are times when you look at his paintings, you could almost imagine if you could reach into one, you could feel exactly how that texture would feel in real life. You like Norman Rockwell's work too? Hey, I'm recording. All right, Gasper, I gotta get on with this book review. And it still blows my mind that he did this with oils because there is so much realism behind his work and he captures the likeness of people so well. It definitely borders on being realistic while still having a style, and he's somewhere right in between that. I also think he's the best artist to ever capture specifically shoes and boots. It's almost like he wanted to be a cobbler, or maybe he was one in a past lifetime. Similar to Muka, he did a lot of advertising work, specifically for magazine covers. And the reason I like this book is it's so big that you can really get up close and personal with each and every one. And it makes sense that a lot of his work was center framed because when you're doing cover work, you want to make it pop out and stand out. And the reason I think people don't enjoy the Americana style anymore is because they think it features this very stereotypical family life in America. And even though, yes, it has evolved over the years, when I look at his paintings, I just see stories. Because Rockwell was really smart in what he included in the illustration to give clues as to the overall picture that you're looking at. A lot of his illustrations are capturing these moments in time that either have historical value or they're just playful. I really enjoy flipping through this book too just as a texture study because like I mentioned earlier, I think they're really good, but it also predates a plastic era. So every fabric that you're seeing has like a story behind it, whether it's quilt or wool or cotton. And then when you get into the woods and the metals and even the leather that he includes, he just does a really good job at capturing those unique materials and distinguishes them from one another. So if you're an artist that wants to do material study, I actually think this book is a great recommendation for just that. And it's funny, flipping through the pages, it actually has a little bit of that noise grain effect that you see so much nowadays in Photoshop, but obviously this predated all of that. So when you know, whoever the cameraman was taking the photos of his paintings, it just naturally added this little element of granular design, and it's just really nice to look at. It really gives influence to how digital artists can pick up on what was so effective with traditional artists back in the day. And Rockwell was just one of a few artists that at that time created this certain look of art. And Lion Decker, who I also have his book, gets compared to Rockwell a lot. And while Lion Decker has a really cool style to his work, I prefer Rockwell's personally, just because Lion Decker, I think, focuses more on style, where Rockwell really focused on the story elements. So yeah, I love Norman's work, and if you want a collection that really showcases material, story, and illustration work, then this is a great book to have. So stepping back into the modern art world, we have our next art book, which is by James Jean, and his book, which I believe is pronounced Paredolia. So James is another artist that would be considered a living legend, and I really do think he earns that title. His work is truly masterful, and his style is so distinguishable that I think that is such a goal for a lot of artists to have their style and voice be unique when compared to a line of other artists. And what's great about this book is not only does it show more of his modern works, but it shows a lot of the oil paintings he did back in the day. And to see the growth from where he was to what he's doing now is just a really cool transition. And like a lot of other artists on this list, he also does ornate details with intricate design, and I'm just a sucker for that apparently. And this book really shows the range of what he's capable of doing, because yeah, you see the oil paintings, but then you also see the very clean, intricate line work. And some of it's digital, some of it's traditional, and then you see the full digital color, and it really encompasses the full spectrum. Similar to Harry Clark's stuff, I find James's work to be beautiful, but it borders on sometimes being creepy or a little bizarre. But for me, I love looking at something and trying to figure out what exactly am I 
are looking at and piecing it together. And then similar to Amano, he will pick colors that normally I don't really enjoy seeing or seeing the color palette all together, but he works it in a way that it balances so well. James is also known for this kind of loopy, watery edge that he sometimes adds to his illustrations, and it's very cool and it's become like a staple of his work. Overall, I just really enjoy flipping through the pages of this book, and it's still cool to see him producing to this day, so I'm sure there will be another art book that I will want of his in the near future, but for now, I would say this is the one I would recommend. Okay, next up we have Circus by Yoko Higuchi. So speaking of bizarre art books, this is definitely one of them. I first spotted this at a Comic Con and immediately I picked it up and within like the first 10 pages, I was like, okay, I'm gonna buy this because it's so bizarre and so intricately detailed with these unique concepts that I knew this would be an inspiring book to have. And this book certainly focuses on a lot of animals, specifically with cats, but the way she draws them is so different and bizarre that I just love it. She has a really good grasp of line control and weighting, and it does it in a way that doesn't feel overly produced. It feels very soft and purposeful. And the book layout itself does such a good job at showcasing her work because it seems to complement it. It knows when it should frame it and it knows when it should go full bleed. And it's cool to see the collection over the years where you can see some of her advertising work and then some of her personal illustration work. I really enjoy seeing both because you can see how one can influence the other. And there are some spreads in this book that are just filled to the brim with her intricate design and detail and it's just really enjoyable to look at. So I've only known of Yoko's work for a few years now, and once I followed her on social media, it's been exciting to see her post whenever she does something new, and I hope eventually it'll be collected into another art book, because I enjoyed this one so much, I would love to have any future ones that she makes. And by now, you probably know that I like these overly intricate, bizarre design elements, but what's different about hers is I feel like it touches on a side of playfulness. And a large part of that is due to the animals that she includes in her work, and they're just so kooky in the way that she styles them in the clothing. I just think it's really funny. I also want to note that this book really showcases both her line work that's just black and white and a lot of her color work and it almost feels 50-50. So this one's fun to look at whether you're more interested in black and white or color because you get both. So if this kind of kooky style of art speaks to you then I would definitely recommend Circus. So next up we're gonna get even weirder and this is a collection of artwork from Akishi Ueda and this book is called Cosmos. So I've been following their work for quite some time on social media, but I had no idea that they had an art book. But last time I was at Emerald City, I went to a Kinokuniya bookstore nearby, and I saw this cover and instantly knew who it was. I was so surprised to see it, but it was wrapped in plastic. Now normally, I'm not a big fan of blind buys when it comes to art books, because I've definitely been burned in the past with ones that I didn't really like. But I decided to take a chance on this one, and it was definitely worth the risk. This book is exactly what I was hoping it would be, where it has a lot of full bleed shots of their work. And when it comes to art books, sometimes it's just that simple. I don't always necessarily like when artists overcomplicate their art books, like sometimes just keep it simple and keep it focused on what matters, which is the art. Sometimes it takes me just a little bit to figure out what it is I'm even looking at, but I almost don't care because it's so beautiful and so well done that I can just appreciate it for what it is, even before figuring out what exactly it actually is. <laughs> and they have such a beautiful way of adding textures and elements within their sculptures that it really does take some time to fully appreciate all of it. And I love how bonkers it is. It's definitely fantasy, but it's so bizarre fantasy that it almost creates its own realm of existence. So their work has a really good combination of heavy textures being ornately fantastical, but then there's always a story element that seems to be present, but it's not obvious. And I love when you get to kind of piece together what that story is and interpret it for yourself. And because their work is so bizarre, you would feel that everything would be so detached from one another. But I definitely could see all of these creatures and all of these designs living in the same universe. And that's when I think an artist has really created something special, when you can really feel this world that is brand new that you get to step into. I would personally say that's a really good sign of a great artist, because they're so Showing something that feels uniquely them. I just really enjoy this artist, and this is easily the best blind buy art book that I've ever gotten in my life. And now you can also own it for yourself without it being a blind buy because you know what's inside. So definitely worth it in my opinion. So for the next one on my list, I just wrote anything Jeremy Bastian because I think anything he does is incredible. And I have a few of his sketchbooks, but for this video, I'm going to showcase his Cursed Pirate Girl series. So my friends know I don't really give compliments out that easily. 
But for Jeremy Bastian, I would say I think he is the best living draftsman alive right now. His line work is phenomenal. It's so good. And what's crazy is I thought for the longest time he was doing this with a micron pen, but when you look at the details, you would assume, okay, well it has to be a pen because they're so stable and they're so clean. I found out when talking with him that he actually does it with a brush with like a single thistle and then he dips it in ink and he literally lays it out with a brush one stroke at a time and that's insane to me. His level of patience and commitment to his work is just astounding. And I just feel like you don't see that a lot nowadays, especially with the movement towards more digital and especially with this whole AI movement. I see people pulling away from you know work that is more tedious when it comes to making art, but he is very dedicated and he is one of those inspirations for me that I am so glad I discovered. So now I hope I can pass that on to you guys. And if you're new to Jeremy Bastian's work, you are in for a treat. So his line weighting and quality is just excellent. He definitely loves playing with super hyper detail and almost as you pull back, it becomes just a texture on its own. Like it becomes this visual noise that you can only appreciate if you look super close up. And he's also another artist that balances super complex detailed areas with a lot of negative space. He understands how that can really add to the composition, and his books do a really good job of showcasing that. So when you first flip through The Cursed Pirate Girl, it starts off really good, but then as you keep going and as he keeps writing and illustrating this novel, it just gets better and better. So as much as I want to talk about his first book, I'm actually going to talk about the latest one that I got, and I think it is literally one of the best graphic novels I think I've ever seen. So this art book, even though it's super thin, it's called The Devil's Cave, and it is so good. It is so good. Look at these pages. They are just outrageously intricate. And I almost get upset when more people don't know about him because you see what's popular on social media, and then you see art like this, and you're like, oh, okay, so this is like real art. <laughs> I don't know how else to describe it, but I, I think so highly of it, if you can't already tell. And I swear this isn't sponsored from him or anything. It's been kind of cool becoming friends with him over the years because we see each other at cons, and I just appreciate that he still creates work that is just mind-blowing. And I want to thank Jeremy for being such a good artist. Because while I feel like there's a lot of artists that are kind of lowering the standard of what art is, I feel like Jeremy is working equally hard to just keep that standard as high as it possibly can be. So I think the world of it, and I think this would be a great book to add to your collection. So this next book might seem like an odd choice considering the previous books that I've been recommending, because it focuses solely on interior design and environments. But I absolutely love this book. It is called Houses with a Story by Yoshida Seiji. So why does this book speak to me when I almost normally never pick up books that are focused on environments? Well, because this one has storytelling elements that are so subtle that it's incredible when you start to pick up what this book is trying to say. And initially, I only bought it because it has this little Final Fantasy looking character on the cover, so I was intrigued to see if there would be more of that. But what I was treated to was such a better experience than what I was expecting. This book, along with two other ones that I got at Emerald City in 2021, really changed my mind of what a book could be. Even the contents in the chapter layout of this book was so bizarre when you first look at it because every chapter break is just a different building and it didn't really make sense. But then when you go to the page, you start to understand, oh, I get it, because every spread tells a different story about the environment, the building itself, and then the interior of the building. And then if you're lucky, you also get a little snippet of who would live there. And it's just a beautiful way of storytelling without actually understanding the words that are <laughs> written on the page, but you get to understand it as a viewer just because it's so easy to get wrapped up into the stories that these houses are trying to tell. And this really spoke to me because I feel like I've written off environment books or just environment art in general just because I didn't find them as appealing as character art, but I feel like this book helped me understand why environments and why interiors can be just as special. And what was really fun about these is the only English part in the book is the title of the house or the room, and you get to see the character, but that's all you get. And it's up to you to kind of fill in the blanks of how does this character live and why do they put things there? And are they a more particular person? Are they more clean? Are they more messy? And you just get to develop your own story based on what you're seeing. So if you're someone like me that mostly focuses on illustration work or character stuff, I think this might be a nice surprise for you. And it's so consistent in the layout that you know with every turn of the page, it's going to be this fun surprise of seeing what new interior there is and how that person chooses to live there. 
So yeah, I really enjoy this book, and most of the pages have this spread type layout, but what's cool is in the back, they also have a section where they show the line art of all the houses, and then they have a process of how it was created from start to finish. What a great book to introduce how interior design and environments can be just as engaging and compelling. And I am so glad that I discovered this because it made me look at it in a different light, and maybe it will for you as well. So my next art book is actually one of my newer ones, and it is Franklin Booth, A Silent Symphony. And I'm amazed that I didn't really know of his work before last year, because if you haven't noticed from the previous book recommendations, I love overly intricate design and I love black and white. And he literally encompasses both of those, but it wasn't until I started flipping through the pages that I realized, oh, I see a lot of his images on Pinterest, I just never knew who it was. So now I have an entire collection of his work and I'm so excited because it was like being a kid at a candy store where anything seemed appealing because it all just spoke to me. While not as strange as Harry Clark, he is another artist that works very confidently with bold values. So he could have one illustration that's very dark, and the majority of it is this bold dark value, but then he'll add little highlights and pieces that distinguish what you're looking at, and then at the same time, he could have another illustration that's mostly negative space, and then he'll have really intense dark shadowy figures, but yet it balances and reads so well. And he is an artist that utilizes hatching, which is a technique where you draw lines to create value and shape, and he does it in a way that is so masterful that it's a delight to see. Especially when he's creating clouds or texture or fabric, he really understands where to make it darker, where to make it lighter, and when the line should shift or when it should change direction, and it's really wonderful to look at. And then similar to artists at that time, he also did a lot of advertising work, so a lot of his illustrations will be big and bold, and then he'll have a giant square or rectangle of just pure white. And that would be mostly used to fill in the words of the advertisement, but I like how this book kept those areas blank, because I think it actually adds to the composition as a whole. It's really bold, especially when you think of contrast in a detail contrast. You have these very intricate illustrations and then just a giant piece of negative space. I just find these to be visually appealing, and they kind of remind me of the old storybooks from way back in the day, where they would design every element of the page, including the border. So even though he paints these more realistic settings, it almost has this fantastical element to it because of these borders. So I feel kind of bad that all this time I was looking at his work and had no idea what his actual name was, but now I have a full art book of his work and a lot of it that I didn't even know existed. So I'm very excited about this art book. It's still new to me, so I feel like I haven't fully absorbed it, but it's already so inspiring that I can already put it on my list. For this next art book recommendation, I feel like I'm kind of cheating because these technically aren't art books, but the art within them are so good that I'm gonna count them anyways and that is the entire series of Witch Hat Atelier. So as another black and white book on my list, this one stands out to me because it focuses on line weighting and how you can do a lot with minimal addition. It does a great job of implying texture with just a few dots or a few lines to create that. And there are some pages that just feel like the artist is showing off, where if any character is running, jumping, flying, floating, the fabric is just gorgeous and they know exactly how to capture it while still feeling realistic, but in a very stylized manner that you just feel the movement. And you would feel because there are so many panels that need to be filled that there would be some pages that feel rushed. But when I was going through it, I never felt that sense at all, and there are some of the smaller panels that feel just as beautiful as the larger ones. So like I said, I know I'm kind of cheating with this entry, but I don't care. I think the art is just so good that it can't not be considered one of my top art book recommendations, considering how much I actually reference this for my own work. So the last entry on this list may make a few of you roll your eyes, but I really do look through these books quite a bit, and they're obviously close to my heart because they're my own art books and I'm gonna do my best not to make this sound like a shameless plug. There are times when I'm working on a new piece and I'll just get stuck, and I'm not sure why because it's an art hurdle that I've gotten over before, but for some reason I just can't get over it this time. So instead of staying in that state of frustration, I'll just flip through some of my old art books. And more often than not, it's not because I need a direct comparison of what I need to do, it's just that gentle reminder that you love making art, you love drawing, and sometimes I'm too serious or I'm too controlling in the moment and I need to let go of that and have some fun with it. 
And when I think of my work, I definitely like to play in a more fantastical realm with details that are overly decadent and intricate design. But a lot of the times I do see the playfulness right underneath the surface. And just seeing that sometimes is the push I need to get over that hurdle. And when creating my own art, I definitely try to make it look as good as I possibly can. But I feel like I'm playing that balancing act of it looking uh, soft and delicate, yet strong and confident. And there's a middle ground in between that, and I try to aim for that every time. Working primarily with pencil, I've learned a lot over the years of working with contrast and value specifically to create my compositions. That's not to say that they always work, and there are times where I get really frustrated at myself because I feel like I'm putting too much in the drawing, and I have to remind myself to actually take away. Sometimes less really is more. But the times where I can really throw a bunch of decadent detail into a piece and it still reads okay, I feel really proud of those images because I feel like that speaks more true to who I am. So here are some illustrations from my latest art book, and this is definitely the one I'm most proud of. I normally release a new art book every two years, but this art book is the biggest one because it also went through 2020. And since there were no conventions that year, I just had a whole lot of time to do a whole lot of drawing. So if you enjoy pencil work with just a little bit of a fantasy flair, you might enjoy my art books. Now I'm not here to try to convince you otherwise, you could hate them, you could use them as tinder for the fire. I just felt it would be wrong for me not to include them if I'm making a list of art books that I reference the most and not include these. Okay, so that is the current list of art books that I reference the most, but I didn't realize how long it would take me to talk about them and I still have a lot more books to go, but it's already starting to get dark. So I'm gonna finish up tomorrow when we talk about the more objective-based books. And these are the ones that are focused more on you learning and growing as an artist. So if we do this transition right, we should be into tomorrow right now. Okay, how was that? Either way, let's talk about some more art books. So on my notes here, I have four different categories I wanna talk about, and that's anatomy, animals, fashion and clothing, and then decorative and ornamentation books. And the only reason I don't have a color section is because I really think there's only one book you need for it, and that is Color and Light by James Gurney. I feel like this book is on every single YouTuber's recommended list, so I'm not gonna talk about it too much besides the fact that, yes, I also agree this book is really, really good when it comes to understanding color. I use this book a lot, especially when I worked back at CG Cookie and I was teaching myself, I would always reference this book. And this book has a lot of illustrations that aren't just from James. He also includes a lot of different artists within this book. And then he goes through how that artist is putting color and light within their work and why he thinks it's effective and why it's capturing it so well. So even though, yes, you're going to get a lot of learning with this book, it could also kind of double as an art book itself. There's a reason why so many artists talk highly of this book. So I'm not going to say much more. I'll just say if you want to get better with your understanding of color and light, then this is the book for you. Now let's go through some anatomy books. I have quite a few of them, but there are four that really stand out. The first is called Human Anatomy for Artists. And this book is dense. It is really big. And every page has a clean close-up shot of some part of the body, whether it's showing the skin, the bones, or the muscle. And this is one that I used a lot, especially when I was in college. So if you're looking to strictly understand anatomy better, I would say this is a great book recommendation. The next one is called Classic Human Anatomy. And it's similar to the last one where it showcases a lot of the body, the muscles, close-ups, that kind of thing. But this one also goes through more of the function of the body. And I mean more of when you turn the different parts of the body, how do the muscles respond to that? Because of course, while it's great to understand where the muscles go on the body, it's also important to know how they move, especially as you are posing your characters, you want to make sure that the muscles are corresponding to that movement. Oh, good morning. Good morning. Good morning, baby boy. So this one's great if you want to start posing your characters and you really do want it to feel accurate. Speaking of movement, the next book, Figure Drawing for Concept Artists, takes that notion and pushes it even further. It talks about how to capture the body in movement and how to simplify it in a way that can still be read correctly. So I really like this book because it helps you capture the form of the body, but quickly in a way that doesn't lose a lot of the movement or a lot of the complexity that the human body can have. And especially if you like going to life drawing sessions, this book is great at showcasing how you can break down the shadow forms and capture the body. So as you're getting more familiar with anatomy, I would say this book is a good recommendation then to learn how to capture it quickly. And my last anatomy book is called Drawing Human Anatomy. And I love this book so much because it was the only one back in the day that I could find that didn't have popcorn superhero muscles as the model. They had more of a thinner, leaner muscle guy be the model. And I just love the way that they captured the forms on the human body. 
So for me, I'm not drawing these barbarian looking men, and I prefer a leaner, slender look to the body, so having this art book reference was just the perfect tool. So if any of you want to draw the male anatomy and proportions without it being like this crazy superhero build, then this is definitely a good book for you to have. Okay, and those are my anatomy books, and there are so many out there that I'm sure I could cover way more, but these are a good solid four that I would recommend out the gate. Next up, I'm gonna share with you my favorite animal and plant books. I know nowadays most people would just find their animal references on Google or Pinterest, and they might think that having a book like this might be redundant, but I still find them valuable. And my favorite book on the topic has to be The Concise Animal Encyclopedia. And this book really does have hundreds upon hundreds of drawings of these different animals. And I like that they chose to do art of them rather than take photos. This way you have the animals isolated and you're not distracted by the surrounding elements or if there were shadows in the picture. I really love this type of animal reference, especially if I'm trying to draw them in one of my own illustrations. And this one covers the entire kingdom, whether it's in the water, on the land, in the air. This really covers every animal that you can think of. So if you want to dive deeper into the underwater creatures, this next one kind of falls in the same vein of this book, but it focuses just on marine life, and it's called Marine Life. So I use this book a lot, especially when I'm doing my mermaid drawings, and I like having fish surrounding that central figure. This book is definitely more niche, but if you like drawing nautical stuff, then yeah, I think this one would be a good one to add to your collection. This next book is specifically on capturing the animal's form and capturing it in movement specifically. And this one's called The Art of Animal Drawing, Construction, Action Analysis, and Caricature. Similar to my figure drawing book for anatomy, this one tries to break down the forms of the animal quickly so that you as the artist can understand how it works and how you can capture it for yourself. Because drawing animals can certainly be tricky. I don't know how many of you have done the blind animal drawing challenge, but if you try to draw a giraffe or a gorilla without reference, it may look a little off. So this book reminds us that you should break down the form of the animal first, and if you can remember what those forms are, then it's way easier to add the details on top. And a lot of the times, when I see artists drawing animals, they sometimes look a little stiff or too overly posed. And this book does a great job at adding movement and turning the animals in a way that helps you see it more in perspective. So if you really want to draw more animals in your work, I think this book does a great job at breaking it down in a way that's easy to understand, and that way when you draw it for yourself, I think they'll come up better. So those were my three fauna book recommendations, and I only have one flora, but I think it's so good that it's the only one that I would recommend. This one is called Botany for Artists. This book is absolutely incredible on understanding how plant life works. This book kind of doubles as a really good education tool, so if you want to get more familiar with understanding how plants even work, this is a really good resource. But obviously as an artist, I also really love how the artist in this book captured the forms of the different plant lives, and they do a really good job at explaining why it looks this way. And it doesn't just go through pretty flowers, it goes through more of the uglier side of nature, even though I, th I think it's beautiful, but it has a lot of the gnarly roots and bark, and it captures a lot of that as well. I feel like I don't even have to say that much, just flipping through these pages alone, you can see why this would be such a fun book to look through as an artist. So yeah, if you wanna understand plant life more and capture more of that in your drawings, this is definitely the number one book I would recommend. Next up, we have my fashion and clothing book recommendations. So as primarily a character artist, I'm drawing people all the time, which means I have to draw clothes all the time, and I wanna make sure as I'm drawing them that it looks right. And because I have a little bit of an interest in fantasy flair fashion, I definitely wanna look back to the past and how it was captured over the years and see if there's any elements I can take from that and apply it to my own work. So the first three books on this list does just that. The first one is called Folk and Festival Costume, a historical survey with over 600 illustrations. This book is really interesting because on every single page, the left side will give an origin story of whatever country or whatever culture it would be, and then the right side is just pictures of people wearing that culture's fashion. And because the illustrations are on the simpler side, it's easier to understand the shapes and the blocking if you want to take any of that for yourself for your own drawings. And it does a great job at showing where the textile or the pattern would be next to other areas that are either bold in value or just simple in negative space. So this one's just a really fun one to have, especially if you're looking to take inspiration from different parts of the world. And this next book definitely gets more detailed with their drawings, and it's called Historic Costume in Pictures. This one is so, so good because every single page has multiple figures wearing multiple pieces of clothing 
and it does a great job at detailing them as well. And unintentionally, this book kind of doubles as reference for when people are talking to one another, because there's a lot of illustrations in this book of two people just standing and talking, but it does look very natural and it looks really good. So I use it as reference for that on top of the reference for the fashion. And this one also covers a diverse spread of different regions, and it definitely borders more in the fantasy realm, but obviously if you're a fantasy artist, this would be perfect. So this is one of my newer books that I got while I was at New York Comic Con, and I've already been using it a lot because I think it's just really fun to even look through. And then if you want to get a little more specific, but in that same vein of illustration drawing, my next book called Victorian Fashions and Costumes from Harper's Bazaar, 1867 through 1898, does just that. So if you really like that Victorian style of fashion, where it's overly ornate, there's a lot of lace and there's a lot of frills, then this is a really good reference book. I also like how a lot of the times in this book, it'll isolate different parts or different sections of the clothes for you to look at and it really highlights just that specific area. I think books like these are just great to use as not only reference books, but in learning how to understand how fabric actually falls on the body, especially with the weight of gravity pushing down on it. So this one's definitely a little more specific, but if you're into the look of this, then this is a really fun reference book to have. So for my last fashion book, this is more of a personal preference. You can have any art book that focuses on a singular fashion designer, but for me, my pick would have to be Alexander McQueen. I secretly really love avant-garde fashion, and I feel like Alexander does a great job at kind of bordering on spooky while still being very, you know, deliberately big and bold. His designs and elements are just bizarre, and I love that he brought that to the fashion world in a way that I don't think has really been seen before. Like I mentioned before, there's a lot of books out there like this, so if you're into fashion, maybe look at the other ones like Christian Dior or Chanel. There's a lot of different fashion houses that you can dive deeper into with these type of books. So I really like this book just because it's fun to flip through, and it's cool to see how he would play with different elements and then put them within this ensemble, and yet still have it work and fit all together. So yeah, those would be my fashion and clothing book recommendations. So this last section in my book recommendation video is definitely more specific, and it's for an artist that really likes ornamentation and decorative design. So if you're into that kind of stuff, these books might be for you. So I got these books when I was first getting introduced to filigree design and learning how cool and how intricate you can make them. And these books are called Fantastic Ornament. These books might be smaller, but I still think they pack quite a punch. These books do a really good job at zooming in and focusing on these isolated elements of overly decorative design. You could almost imagine them in like a really fancy European palace. And I love how it showcases how everything flows together, even though there's a lot of intricate design going on throughout it. And obviously I like the decadence of including a lot of cherubs and marble statues and floral arrangements alongside these really pretty filigree patterns. So I think these books are great as references if you wanna just recreate something that you see in the pages here, or if you wanna take some of the elements and then apply it to like a border in a storybook or something like that. So similar to those books, I have another one called Fantastic Gothic and Renaissance Ornament. And this one is very similar, but it's a different artist that's capturing those style of elements. So this one covers just even more of what you already saw. And I think the more books like these that I can own, the better, because I'm using them all the time, especially when I'm doing architecture or interior design stuff that I want to be more complex. And plus, these books are relatively cheap, so I think they're just great ones to own, especially if you're getting interested in this style of work. So then if you wanna go a step further and take that filigree and then apply it to like pattern making and fabrics, then this next book called William Morris, Father of Modern Design and Pattern, might just be the one for you. This book is very extensive, and every page showcases a different pattern and fabric that is different than the page before. So I love these type of books that show how you can take really complex patterns and still arrange them in a way that is pleasing to the eye. Because it's very easy for a lot of complex imagery to be thrown all together, and it just looks kind of messy. But this book kind of goes through how you can still have a lot of crazy patterns next to each other and still have it work. So if you're into floral pattern and complexity, I think this one's a really good one to own. And also, the cover's really fun to look at. And this one's published by Hiroshi Uno. They've actually done a few of the books on the list that I've given today, but they do a really good job at bringing together a comprehensive look at a specific subject matter, whether it's an artist or something like this where it's pattern design. So yeah, I'm always interested in seeing what new book that they publish. Actually, speaking of, this is another book that was published by them, and look how cool this cover is. 
This one's called Beautiful Book Designs from the Middle Ages to the Mid 20th Century. And like the title implies, there's a lot of content in this book specifically on that. And it's gorgeous. This definitely takes you back into like that fantastical Middle Ages realm. And a lot of the way that the book designs were, were just very ornate and very over the top. This one goes through quite a lot of not just the Middle Ages, but it goes through all the way up until I think the 1900s. And it shows a variety of different styles and uh, patterns that they were in. And then this last one falls in line with that. And this one's very specific. This one's called The Bible of Illuminated Letters. So if you remember those fantasy books that started once upon a time and the O in the once was just really ornate and just filled with a lot of decorative elements, then this book kind of showcases just that. It goes through how you can take every letter and add different design elements to make it more gaudy and a little more decorative. So out of all the books that I recommended today, this one's definitely the most like weirdly specific. But it really does a great job at going through how to give the different ornamentation to different letters, different numbers, and it does a good job explaining how to apply gold leaf upon that as well. So if you absolutely love this style or are interested specifically on typography and how to make it feel more fantastical, then I would say this little book is a good one to have. And there we have it. So those are my art book recommendations from my absolute favorites to the more objective based ones. And I'm always looking for new art books, so if there's one that you would want to recommend, please leave it in the comments. I actually do read every single one, and I'm always collecting new books, so I would love to hear from you what one you think I should add to my collection. As always, thanks so much for watching, and I really enjoy making these type of videos, so I hope to do more of these in the future, and hopefully we'll see you in the next one. Okay, take care!